increasing acres in the United States and the winter storm effects on the wheat crop. Right here on Connected Farmer, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. So as usual, we have Mike Zuzlo here and Mike Zuzlo has read all the details about the, the USDA Ag Outlook and he saw that uh, there was an increase on the surface for soybeans and yet uh, the combined uh, uh, acres are bigger than, is bigger than ever. So what do you see behind that, Mike? Well, it isn't a surprise that we went up to 90 million acres for soybeans, Luis, for me, um, because we were rotating back towards soybeans this year anyway. So we're going from about 83.1 to 90, so almost 7 million acreage increase. That doesn't surprise me. In fact, that was right with my estimate that I provided to clients and subscribers. Uh, I think the biggest uh, issue for me is USDA's pushing another million acres into the corn and that taking that up to 92 million acres, we're going to have to have perfect planting weather to get that kind of an acreage base sowed uh, in a time period that will be uh, conducive to maximum yield. So how I will lay out 2021 from here on out until I see the March acreage report and how we look when we physically get ready to plant up here in this Northern hemisphere in the United States is that 92 is the biggest acreage base for planted acres for corn. So I'll start with 92 million as the top end. And if I use a 175 yield for national average yield here in the United States, I use 1.5 billion bushels of carry in from this past month's report. I use USDA's total demand number of 14.62 billion bushels. That still gives me about a 1.85 billion bushel carryover. So still relatively tight. Now flipping back to beans, and I have a question for you if you don't mind answering it. Um, the 90 million acres on beans, if I take that and I use a 51 and a half bushel yield, I use USDA's 120 million bushel carryover from this past year and then I use the same 2020 demand base of 4.575 billion bushels, I still can't get over a 130 million bushel carryover. So we essentially don't build any carryover in the United States, even on that massive jump in acreage base. So that was the official number that came out this morning. And I watched the USDA chief economist talk. I read his speech. I looked at all of his slides. And then a Newswire report came out that said that USDA says we may import beans into the United States. Nowhere in the official documentation was that there. I got a hold of the Newswire. They said that was at a press briefing, and that was kind of complementary with the idea that we may have to bring beans here to the United States, but it won't be for long, may not be much because we have such a big acreage base, but that big acreage base still doesn't bring us back to a large carryover number. So I guess my question is, do you feel like it's likely that we will bring beans into the United States? Typically we bring them into the Wilmington bulk facility in uh, South Carolina. Um, and, and I mean, are the, are the South Americans positioned for that this year or, or are they too delayed to be able to really do any good? I think uh, the answer could be in Argentina. I remember a quite remarkable year in 2015 when uh, Argentinians exported a lot of beans to the United States East Coast and there were bigger stocks uh, in with Argentinian farmers because they were waiting for a government change and uh, the time for more profits had arrived. And uh, with the substantial stocks in Argentina, 
uh, still holding on. Uh, I think uh, that uh, could happen. And also it uh, happened with Brazilian beings sometimes, sometimes not uh, with uh, significant volumes as Argentina, but uh, some beings sometimes are exported to the United States East Coast. But with the uh, harvest delays, I mean, I'm seeing that what were roughly 8% planted in second crop corn in the, uh, in the uh, Safrina corn in Paraná, and I think that is, you're usually at about a third planted at this point, that just spells or says to me that we're not getting the beans harvested to plant that second crop corn. So I guess what I'm trying to do is build a timeline. Obviously, we talked about the price of, of the Paranagua beans and the Upper River beans. Um, the last time I looked was before we went on air and U.S. soybeans at the Gulf, about $536 U.S. dollars a ton. South America, anywhere from 510 to 513. So they're, they're below U.S. prices at this point, not a lot. Um, but I, I suppose if they would drop a little bit more or quite a bit more and we got to maybe the April time frame or do you think March time frame with Argentina, I guess they have the stocks and the farmers could sell those old crop stocks at any time is what you're saying. Yes, the Argentinians can uh, sell the old crop uh, at any time. And also there are some uh, changes coming ahead for the Brazilian uh, farmers and truckers that the government is considering uh, reducing diesel taxes so they would be able to pay less for the fuel. And so Mike, uh, and uh, do you think that the market uh, has already reacted uh, accurately on on these uh, things brought by the the USDA Ag Outlook? Yeah, I think so far, Luis, but there's a lot of data coming tomorrow. Again, it is a two-day conference and we'll get all of the specific commodity outlooks and updated baseline projections. You know, one of the things that's going to be extremely important, well, two things, but they're both related to the demand side of the equation. I feel like we got the supply side issues covered today with the acreage base, but what are the 2021 demand figures going to look like given the fact that we're at these elevated price levels and USDA in their update today did give us fresh figures and forecasts for their average price. They're putting corn at 420 uh, this next year for an average US cash price. That's only down 10 cents from this current price of uh, this current marketing year price. And they're actually raising soybeans to 1125 uh, that's going to be 10 cents above what USDA gave us for this past crop year. Wheat is going to come up 50 cents to $5.50 versus this past year's number of $5. So given these elevated price levels, I really wonder if we're going to have the demand base that we had these past couple years with this increasing feed and increasing exports because things were so much cheaper. And a second demand issue that I think that's going to be really important to watch is the ethanol side of the equation. We got a sneak peek of some information on the demand for ethanol by USDA earlier this week and again this morning when they updated their numbers. They're saying that ethanol demand will not come back to pre-COVID levels. They, it will increase in 2021 above 2020, but we will not get back to pre-COVID levels of 2019 to 2020 marketing year. So that says to me, and they're talking about the whole baseline the next 10 years. So that really says to me what you and I've been kind of talking about, about a new energy policy and lower amount of gas driving uh, combustible engines in, in lieu of more electric vehicles and uh, less uh, more efficient gas combustible engines with the cafe standards probably being raised and the economic issues with what's going on with energy prices right now because of what's happening in Texas and, and the high prices, uh, escalating prices for retail gasoline and retail diesel prices. I think we really have to start putting into our plan as corn and beans producers, uh, the idea that um, the corn ethanol demand is probably going to have peaked at this point uh, next year at this time and it may be even declining at the, that stage. So if we are relying or have been relying the last 10 years on an ethanol plant to sell our cash corn, 
uh, we're real, I think we're really going to have to start working harder to figure out a, a way to get that price, um, that, that higher price someplace else or through some other type of uh, planting of, of different types of corn, whether it's uh, you know, waxy corn or white corn or non-GMO corn, we may have to start getting more creative because the ethanol subsidy and the ethanol demand together, I think uh, USDA is kind of signaling it's it's not going to get any better at this point. And in that picture uh, you are showing us, uh, it seems that uh, the export uh, market is becoming more and more important and uh, there is no room for a uh, trade war. Uh, China is looking for more ethanol and China is playing their, uh, their, their share on, uh, ex on imports for feed meal. Yeah, you bring up a really big point that I don't know if it's going to materialize this year, but I think it's really important to think about in 2022 and maybe later this year, the idea that high food prices, the way USDA increases the exports for us is mainly through the improvement of livestock and meat protein demand. And these other countries producing more and more and more meat for their own population. That's how we get to these higher feed grain and oilseed exports. I am nervous, like I was back in 2011, that high world food prices are only going to create an environment where the wealth effect turns more negative and people can't buy as much because they don't make as much as they did prior to the pandemic and their food prices are so much more expensive, they can't buy what they're used to buying. So I think the global middle class has given us the demand base that we have right now and that USDA is talking about continuing into 2021. I'm nervous by the end of this year, and this goes back to my expectations that the grain price upside potential becomes less and less if we don't have bad weather the second half the calendar year. This matches up pretty nicely, this issue with, uh, with my overall anticipation or expectation that grain marketing needs to be done the first half of this calendar year, then the livestock marketing can be done in the second half as supplies of, of animals drop here in the United States the second half of the calendar year. So I, I'm pretty much on track with where I've been, but I guess the problem I see right now is, is that a lot of people are getting more and more bullish and price friendly, whether it's the stock market or the, or the gold or the commodities in general. I always worry about the demand side, especially the high prices and food issues. And that's what 2011 taught me that. I was in South Africa at the time when we were running through very high prices. And I remember going to Johannesburg and picking up a paper and the, on the very front page was high food prices hurting the local population down there. And I thought this was, this was supposed to be uh, a, a, a warning signal for me. And I took it that way. And it wasn't long after that we had that 2012 drought, and that really took prices too high in the food side and for consumers. And look what happened after that. We had five plus years of bad prices. So I think we really want to be careful not to get too exuberant here. Yes, and uh, it seems that uh, the USDA is on your side on that because uh, they are saying uh, that uh, the food inflation uh, this year will not be as bad as last year. Yeah, I think that's where USDA has got a lot of uh, updating to do. And maybe we'll get some of that on Friday with their individual commodity outlooks uh, when it comes to the demand base. Uh, they, they talked about the Chinese corn demand and how the Chinese are taking on so much more corn as opposed to Milo. And, and as opposed to DDGs, well, that's because the DDGs and the Milo have already run up in prices and corn is the cheapest thing out there. But then what happens when corn gets expensive? So when the substitutes run out, that's when I start to worry more that the demand has peaked. And I don't think USDA has yet said the demand has peaked. We'll see what they say tomorrow. Yes, and let's, let's talk about wheat because uh, we were, were seeing several states in the U.S. with a lot of lack of uh, moisture 
in uh, recent weeks, but, but then uh, the snowstorm came and uh, it seems that it's not clear what happened with the crop. Uh, some people are saying that uh, the snow brought the moisture that was needed, uh, but uh, other people are saying that uh, it, co it could cause havoc. Uh, what are you seeing there? It, it's causing havoc, in my opinion, Luis. I, I will have been out in this part of the country in northeastern Kansas, which is still, I'm probably about an hour and a half away from the true winter wheat belt, the hard red wheat belt. Uh, but, but with the clients that I know and that, that I've picked up and with the other communications that I have, uh, I will have been out here eight years this spring, and I think this is the worst winter we will have had on the wheat crop since I've lived here. And I'm looking for a lot of lost acres if the weather doesn't dramatically change when we break dormancy. In other words, when we thaw, we better have a lot of rain to help bring this wheat back around. But there was a lot of the state of Kansas and eastern Colorado that did not get any snow when these very severe temperatures hit. And I've had enough pictures sent to me from clients that it, it is between the very cold temperatures that we're just now facing and then the very windy conditions we had about three or four, well, it's probably been more like six or eight weeks ago. It was back a while, a while back, but we had a terrible outbreak of wind for about a week um, that clients told me they probably lost wheat at that point too. Uh, I think we'll lose acres. I think those acres will go to Milo and soybeans. And I think wheat can, between the Sovicon reducing the crop today uh, on their expectations for Russia. Um, between that and between um, the wheat crop here and, and the continued dry weather that we're looking at here in the Northern Hemisphere, um, I still see wheat as the best leader to the upside um, when it comes to going into the springtime at this stage of the game. And I know corn is fighting and vying for that position because of the Chinese demand, but you can see how the corn has probably topped out because of the wheat and the corn, the spread between those two, the wheat's pulling the corn down at this point. So corn is in need of some wheat support at this point. And how different uh, is your estimate for the U.S. wheat output from the USDA's? Well, we'll know that on Friday because we'll get some fresh yield estimates for the new crop, but I, don't, I cannot see us being um, much above the low end of the five-year national average. Mitigating the national wheat yield number from being too low is that the soft red wheat crop east of the Mississippi River essentially has gotten a lot of rain and a lot of snow and it's probably in one of the best conditions it's ever been in. So that's what we're going to have to navigate here is a hard red wheat crop that maybe is the worst in 10 years in a soft red wheat crop that maybe is the best in 10 years. So I have to really balance that out with the national yield. But the 45 million all wheat planted acreage number was a little bit lower than what I'd estimated uh, USDA would say today, but it's really, it's relatively close to what everybody was expecting. And how are you seeing profitability? Because sometimes for the Colorado grower, the Montana grower or the Northern Dakota grower, Numbers are pretty different uh, from the guys of uh, from the heart of the corn belt, but uh, yeah, and this is where it goes back to you know the Kansas crop really does move the hard red wheat national yield. It's pretty much the national. It's going to be the national yield for the hard red wheat crop. It and it can ding or take down the overall national yield. But um, I, I just think it's going to be really hard to get much over a forty bushel yield at this stage, and and probably a high thirties would not surprise me at all. But I'll, I'll look at that more detail a month from now when we get ready to break dormancy and I look at the drought monitor maps. Yes, and you always talked about uh, in the last uh, weeks or for the last month that uh, probably the second half of the year would be better for livestock producers, as you said today. But uh, what happens if uh, we have bad crops? Uh, what, what would be the scenario for the livestock producers if that happens? You know, that's a really good question because historically, in my experience, we have the livestock go higher with the grain markets if they're both short on supply. 
And that's a function of the corn and bean prices getting and meal prices getting high enough that we see weights collapse, that we see marketings for hogs, chickens, and cattle all pulled forward at lighter weights. And so the poundage, the production number drops rather dramatically because it's, it's, it's A, if the prices are high, that's a good per head price and B, feeding expensive grain above a certain weight is really inefficient and wasteful. And why do it with prices so high? So I actually think that we could see a similar pattern that we saw in sometimes in the 80s and even sometimes in the 90s, where if we have a strong grain price, if animal numbers are already declining, that uh, feed, that higher feed cost gets built into the cattle or hog price because it's, it's in increasing the value of the animal that way. So I think that that would actually be supportive for the livestock and it would tighten the numbers up even faster if I'm correct. And I think um, you are recommending even more than the previous week that the farmers should sell and defend. Yes, that's right. I mean, I, I really want to do a lot of business on the corn and beans this month. Uh, I'm getting very close to pulling triggers on the cattle and hogs still. I think the cattle may have peaked already this week uh, with the stock market potentially peaking. And so I'm really watching those two very closely. Um, the weekly export sales have been delayed a day because of the President's Day holiday. That'll come out Friday morning. That's going to be the number one indicator for the hogs for me because the Chinese Lunar New Year we are in the middle of. If we don't see strong pork exports again on this report on Friday morning, I'm nervous that the hog prices have done their job of uh, attracting more marketings and more uh, production and uh, that, that we may be peaking. Uh, one other thing that I would throw out to Luis at this point is the energy issue and the cold weather that has spurred the energy issue in Texas has not just affected the wheat market, it's affected the energy markets, it's affected the ethanol markets, it's affected the cattle markets. And I think even more so than last week, we're backing up marketings, we're not getting the cattle uh, to the marketplace in a, in a regular pace. And we're probably gonna see another increase in weights again this year and this, th this week And if we do, that'll be the fourth week in a row, dress weights will go higher. And the reason I, I'm fearful of that, even with this terribly cold weather and, and the likelihood it's hard to gain weight in this kind of weather, uh, there have been some plants go offline in Texas because of the power outages. So I think we really are backing cattle up right now at a very bad time. You always also talked about the energy policy and how the new energy policy could hurt U.S. farmers, and I think one point of this is the is about the electric cars because if uh, the United States and Europe go electric, then uh, the top uh, U.S. major ag competitors are in, in the southern hemisphere. Doesn't that make uh, the southern hemisphere competitors stronger? It does. And I think as you become less energy independent in a country as big economically as the United States, someone is going to have to fill that void for a time until we get to that green energy plateau or level. And I'm hopeful that some good can come out of the terrible issues that and the tragedies that have occurred in Texas as a result of this terrible cold weather and the alternative energy um, being about a third of their normal energy uh, supply during the winter time months. And what I mean by that is, is that we really don't want Russia to be a major exporter of oil into the United States. It'll only increase our costs. I mean, look what's happening to the unleaded gasoline and the diesel prices right now. We're seeing ethanol stockpiles go up, even though distillate diesel uh, stockpiles went down this week and the uh, unleaded stockpiles also went down this week. So, I mean, I think we're looking at a situation where if we take prices too much higher in the energy sector here in the United States, that's going to hurt agriculture disproportionately because we have such an energy intensive cost of production, whether it's chemicals, fertilizers, or just the transportation usage. So that is in, in the end, 
either going to help another country like Brazil who produces or Russia who produces energy, or it's gonna hurt the consumer if there's no other supplier to be able to get uh, food and, and raw material like soybeans and corn from another country. So I think we really have to consider this, especially in light of the idea that our whole uh, country's situation since the Great Depression back in the early 20th century was a cheap food policy to curb hunger and malnutrition. And I think we're gonna to have to go back and readdress this type of policy when we go back and look at the climate and the ener new energy policies as well. I hope our policymakers do that uh, because it, it, there's a lot at stake. And I think the Texas issue is really showing us that right, right now. So sorry to go off onto a policy tangent, but uh, you kind of opened the door for me. Yeah, and uh, we took you more time today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Louise.